Okay, uh, we'll get started. So in the previous lecture, we were talking about this notion of geometric multipliers. And I want to uh, redraw a few figures that I, draw in the, I drew in the previous class. So I have this set S, which is the set of all gx fx pair for x in capital X. This is my dx. This is my f of x. If I draw a line, a hyperplane, which has g of x and f of x, uh, it sits somewhere on the line, then the y-intercept is exactly equal to, let me call it g of x bar f of x bar. So then this is exactly equal to l of x bar comma mu. The normal to this hyperplane is mu comma 1. Okay, so that was the first thing we recognized. I draw a hyperplane with normal mu comma 1. Um, it passes through g of x bar, f of x bar. Then the y-intercept of this hyperplane is exactly equal to L of x bar mu. Now I'm going to translate this hyperplane so that the set S is in the positive half space. So that hyperplane is going to be something like this. Okay, so this hyperplane also has normal mu comma 1. That's the normal vector to this hyperplane. And it intercept the y-axis at inf of Lx comma mu, x is in capital X. This is the minimum possible achievable intercept with this particular normal, okay? So this was the first figure from the previous class, and this is the second figure I wanted to draw. No. This is and this was the second figure where we stopped in the previous class. So let's look at this figure. This is the figure we want to analyze today. <coughs> Okay, so I have this set S, I have drawn three lines. Can someone tell me what is this intercept? That intercept is for this particular line. So this is in for L of X mu, 
x is in capital X mu 1. This is inf of L of x mu 2. And this is inf of L x mu 3. OK, so those are the three intercepts in that figure. So one thing that I wanted to mention, which you may not know uh, beforehand, so all of these mu's are non-negative. So this mu actually is equal to 0. Mu 3 is equal to 0 because it's a horizontal line. Mu 2 is like a non-negative number. Mu 1 is a positive number. So this is positive, this is positive. And when I draw a vertical line, let's say I draw something like this, then this is actually infinity 1. So mu, the value of mu for a vertical line is infinity. The value of mu for a horizontal line is 0. And the value for mu for a, for a hyperplane that is going upwards, this is a minus 5 comma 1. So this mu is actually a negative value. Okay, this is just something that you should, you should know. It's not obvious from the figure, but when you actually look at the normal to the hyperplane, this is what you will find, that these are the only positive non-negative mu's that you have, a horizontal line, or a, or a line that looks like this, but it's not vertical. So we are not considering the cases where mu is negative, okay? Because by definition, mu has to be a non-negative number, a non-negative vector. So in this figure, what I have done is I have drawn several, several hyperplane for which S is in the positive half space and the normal consists of a non-negative vector and one. And I have drawn something where the normal is actually zero, so I cannot really draw something which is, which is going this way, because then the normal would be negative. What do you think about this, this point? So this point is inf of Lx mu 3. What, what comes to your mind when you look at this point? So no matter what kind of, uh, what mu I pick, positive value of mu I pick, I'm only going to be below this line, okay? This is the maximum I can achieve, and every, every other hyperplane that I will draw will have an intercept which is below this particular intercept, right? That's obvious by looking at the figure. So there is something special about this particular point. What is so special about this point? Great. So this is your g of x star and f of x star. So this is actually equal to f star. The y-intercept is actually equal to f star. And that's because this is the optimal point in the set S. This corresponds to the optimal point within the set S. Okay? And this point, this optimal point, only touches with this particular hyperplane. This point doesn't touch with this hyperplane, and it doesn't touch with this hyperplane. In this case, yes, mu star equal to zero would be the geometric multiplier. But I can show you some other graphs I'm going to show you now, where I will say that mu star equals to zero is not the optimal geometric multiplier. So is this clear why this is equal to f star? This is the maximum that you can get among all hyperplanes for which s is in the positive half space. Let's look at some other figures.
So this is the set S. What's the hyperplane in which S is in the positive? So which is the optimal point? The optimal point is right here. So at this point, G of X is less than or equal to 0, and F of X is minimized. This is F of X. This is G of X. So at this point, f of x is minimized and g of x is less than or equal to 0. I'm going to draw a hyperplane with normal mu1, which has an intercept f star. And the entire set s is in the positive half space. So this is actually the geometric multiplier. This particular mu is the geometric multiplier for this problem. Okay, so in this case, the geometric multiplier is positive, okay, because, because it's, a, it's a line that is slanting, so it's not horizontal, so the geometric multiplier is positive, and it intersects the y-axis exactly at f star. Okay, everyone understands this one? So now I'm going to change the figure again. What is the optimal point here? That's this point, right? That's gx star, fx star. What happens if I draw a line, a hyperplane, where s is in the positive half space? I cannot draw this. I cannot draw this because s is not in the positive half space of this particular hyperplane. The only hyperplane so let me just write it. This is my f star. But it is intersecting. This line is intersecting with the s. So I can't really, I can't really draw this hyperplane. So I'm going to draw another hyperplane. Uh oh. Anyways, this this hyperplane is a is is such that it's touching here and it's touching. Let me just change this. It's touching here as well. And the normal to this hyperplane is mu1. What is the intercept? That intercept is right here. This is my inf of x in capital X. L of x comma mu. What do you notice? I can draw different hyperplanes. This is just one of the hyperplanes. But I can draw many, many hyperplanes in which s is in the positive half space. Let me draw them. Just for kick. So I can draw another one that looks like this. I can draw something that looks like this. These are all the hyperplanes such that the entire set S is in the positive half space. What do you notice? All the y intercepts, just notice the y intercept. That's what I'm interested in. What do we notice among all the y-intercepts? They are all way below f star, OK? So in this situation, there is no geometric multiplier. In this case, there is a geometric multiplier because inf of L of x mu 3 is equal to f star. So mu 3 is equal to mu star, which is the geometric multiplier. In this case, on the other hand, this is the 
inf of l x comma mu and no matter what mu what non negative mu you pick your y intercept is only going to be below f star it can never be equal to f star and therefore there is no geometric multiplier for this particular problem okay so in this case there is no geometric multiplier in this case there is a geometric multiplier Okay, let me repeat. You create a bunch of hyperplanes in which S is in the positive half space and you want to make sure that the highest intercept is equal to F star. If it is equal to, if the highest intercept is equal to F star, there is a geometric multiplier. If the highest intercept is not equal to F star, then there is no geometric multiplier in this problem. Okay. Now, can someone tell me how do I, so in order for me to have a geometric multiplier in this problem, I would, so this is a trick question, okay, unrelated to what we are, I mean, related to what we are talking about, but not part of the book. So the trick question is as follows. So we know in that example, there is a geometric multiplier. In this example, there is no geometric multiplier because there is a gap between the highest intercept and F star. I want to come up with a way to have a geometric multiplier in this problem. What can I do? So here is one idea. If I could break away this part of the set and throw it off, then there is a possibility for me to have a geometric multiplier. So let me draw that part. So, so now remember this was my this was my line. So I'm going to somehow break the set. Remember this was the uh, this was the original set. Okay, so somehow I have broken part of the set. So now I have a geometric multiplier in the new problem. How do I break this part of the set? What exactly did I do? in order to break that set. Can someone tell me? Remember the problem is as follows. I want to solve f of x such that gx is less than equal to 0. x is in capital X. You truncated the capital X? I truncated the capital X. But in what, what region did I truncate it? It doesn't matter what f of x is, where g of x is positive, that's what, that's where I, I have truncated, not for the negative part of f of x. So what I've done is I've constructed a new set, let me call it x tilde, which is a subset of the old set, and g of x minus x tilde is actually a positive number, maybe not equal to, but yeah, it's strictly positive. That's what I have done. In all, the way to truncate this part so as to get a geometric multiplier to exist is to cut down the original set, capital X, where g of x is greater than 0. OK? And this is a very well-known method for solving complicated optimization problems, which we will not talk about in this class. But if you take a course in integer programming and so on, you will study branch and bound method, which exactly is trying to do something like this. Trying to cut down the set where the optimal solution is not going to exist. And that's what this strategy is also doing, yeah. Right, so technically yes, all of this is useless, useless area. But how would you know 
that part. Like once I give you, once I give you a, once I give you a function, so where is this sort of optimization, uh, where is this visualization helpful? So your, this x is 50 dimensional state, this function is very complex, and these constraints are even more complex. How are you going to figure out, if I give you that problem, how are you going to figure out what lies here? It's very difficult, okay? So, so that's why you want to do the computer to do all this job. You, you don't want to do it yourself. But you are right, if, if you can, if you can uh, do it, that would be really great. But if you cannot, then, then it's, a, it's a problem. Right. So are we like ignoring that part or not? Right. So this part is not really part of the feasible, like it doesn't contain any feasible yeah. point. So, but when you are given an optimization problem, you have to, like you can't really cut off the, so here is the situation. I want to minimize x in R, x such that x square is less than or equal to 5. Right? So the set capital X is the entire set of real line, but the feasible point is only minus square root of 5 to plus square root of 5. Right? So arguably in this problem, you can say, hey, look, I, I don't want to consider this problem. It's uh, very complicated. So I'm actually going to consider minimize X. I'm going to consider this problem. Right, and you are right. I mean, this is this is the right uh, answer, and and you can solve this problem maybe by hand. But when you have a 50-dimensional or a 100-dimensional system, then 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 you are in trouble. You can't really do it by hand. Right. We were solving a problem where we wanted to schedule electric vehicles in a very large uh, area, and. We were optimizing a function with 200 states, 200 dimensional state, and some 80 or 90 dimensional action. We haven't talked about dynamic programming yet, but that's the next topic. We will talk about it very soon. So our optimization problem had a bunch of such constraints over an 80 dimensional problem. X was 80 dimensional in that case. So you know it's difficult for us to do that pruning by hand by looking at the equation. Okay. So we have seen that there is a very special, like we have looked at the intercepts, uh, for given problem, and we have found out the following thing. Let me call this Q of mu, which is inf of So I look at the Lagrangian, and I take the minimum of Lagrangian with respect to x. I get a function that is purely a function of mu, and this is known as a dual function. So Q of mu is the basically y-intercept. So this is y-intercept for all hyperplanes. Y-intercept for not all, but for hyperplane.
with normal with mu1 with on mu1 and s is in the s is in the positive half space Okay, so I have to set S. Uh, this is Q of mu1, Q of mu2, Q of mu3, and so on. What is the characteristic of these mu? They are all non negative, right? They are all non negative vectors. So let me try to pose this problem. I want to maximize. Q of mu such that mu is greater than or equal to 0. And let me call this Q star. Where exactly is Q star in this particular figure? In this figure, where is Q star? Q of mu 1. OK. Anyone else has a competing solution for Q star? F star? No, this is, this is F star. But there is no hyperplane with normal mu1 in which S is in the positive half space. OK, so these are all the hyperplanes that I've drawn where S is in the positive half space. But if I want to pass something through F star, if I want to pass a hyperplane through F star, it has to cut into the set S. So the S will not be in the positive half space. OK, so looks like the unanimous uh, decision of the class is this is my Q star, Q of mu 1. That's my Q star. OK, so that is indeed the case, at least by inspection in this figure. That's Q star. That's the maximum I can achieve by picking a mu which is non-negative, this is the maximum intercept that I can achieve. What is something fundamental that you see here? So we have drawn several such graphs so far. And in some cases, we saw that f star, there is f star, there is an intercept which passes through f star. And in this case, we have seen that there is an intercept, but it doesn't pass through f star, but it is below f star. What does this tell you about a fundamental result? Uh, Q star is less than or equal to f star? Q star is always less than or equal to f star. And this is known as weak duality theorem. So Q star is an upper is a lower bound on the optimal value of the optimization problem
why would something like this be useful? Why would we be interested in computing a lower bound to F star? So let me, let me rephrase the question. Suppose, uh, so here is the question. I have an algorithm which outputted x 1000. Okay, after 1000 iteration, you stop the algorithm and you have, f, uh, you have x 1000 and you have f of x 1000. You also ran this dual optimization and you got mu 1000 and you got q of mu 1000. Okay? Now suppose this is the case. Suppose that f of x 1000 minus q mu of 1000 is equal to 10 raised to minus 5. So that's case number 1. And case number 2 is this is equal to 10 raised to 5. That's case number 2. What can you say about the two cases? So case number 1, the difference is actually 10 raised to minus 5. And in case number 2, the difference is of the order of 10 raised to 5. Now that you know this is maximum, q star is maximum, and f star is minimum, what does this give you? So case one seems to be close to optimal. Case two seems to be far away from optimal, right? So that's where this theorem is actually very useful the weak duality theorem, because what weak duality says is that f of xk minus q of mu k is greater than or equal to f star minus q star, not greater than. f of xk is f of x k is greater than equal to f star and q of mu k is less than equal to q star, right? And this is always greater than equal to zero. Yeah, okay. So weak duality theorem says that f star minus q star is always greater than equal to zero. And your algorithm can compute f of xk minus q of mu k. Now this is a small number, you can you can figure out what this number is using MATLAB or whatever other programming language you're using. This is a small number. It means that you are close to the optimal. If this is a large number, then it means you are far away from optimal, which is where weak duality theorem is very, very useful. Yeah. But what if you had like a set, like the one you just drew, but it's, it's very, very extreme? Yes. So like your, uh, your Q star could be very far away. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But you can still be in the optimal That's right. But there is never, there is no way to certify that you are close to the optimal. And that absence of certificate is a big problem in some applications. So you want to have a certificate to say that, look, I am within 10% of optimal solution, right? That sounds so good. Rather than saying, oh, the algorithm has given something, but I don't know what that something is, right? 
So if you go back to 1970s, and let's say FedEx started their operations, and FedEx wants to figure out what's the optimal way to ship packages from one location to another. And they put all that information into the system, and the system came up with some solution. And there is no way for anyone to know whether that solution is a good solution or a bad solution. It's certainly better than any heuristic you can come up with because it's a complex operation. You cannot come up with a good heuristic. So the system is giving you some solution, which is something, but I don't know whether I can trust it to be optimal or not. Now, after knowing weak duality, you can try to solve this dual problem, and you have some way to solve the primal problem. You look at the difference between the two, and if it is small, you have a certificate that you are close to the optimal. If it is large, you lose that certificate. You're, you're far away from the optimal. So you have to come up with a better algorithm. Okay? So in certain situations, people have spent a lot of time to try and come up with an optim try and come up with an algorithm for that specific problem where this, uh, this difference is as small as it, it is possible. Like if you can come up with an algorithm where this is small, uh, then you have actually a very good algorithm. That's also a certificate for you as a researcher that, oh, you have come up with an algorithm that is within 1% of the optimal solution. So some of the famous examples where people have investigated a lot of effort in order to come up with better algorithms is traveling salesman problem, which is the FedEx problem. And the other problem is the, that I'm aware of is the electricity market problem, where they need to figure out which generator will generate how much electricity at what time. Right? And even there, if you lose optimality by 1%, that means a million dollars of losses for the consumers, for us, because we are the ones who finally pay the bill, right? So if you want to generate at the minimum cost so that we pay minimum amount of money for electricity, then they have to get as close to the optimal as possible. And it's a very complicated optimization problem. So, so they look at this, what is known as duality gap. And they want this gap to be of the order of 1% or 3%, something like that. They don't want this gap to be very large. So they want f of xk minus q of mu k over f of xk to be less than or equal to 3%. So they will keep calculating the optimal solution until they reach a pre-specified threshold. And for the electricity market problem that you have solved in some of your assignments, um, it takes about three hours to get to the solution. So for every day, they do this computation for three hours, four hours, get the solution, and then tell each generator, hey, tomorrow at 10 AM, you should be generating 500 megawatt. At 11 AM, you should be generating 520 megawatt and so on and so forth, right? So, so they, they do a, all this computation in order to compute the duality gap, and they only stop when the duality gap is really very small. And every 1% increase here means a million dollars of losses for the consumers, which is us. OK. So that's where this, uh, this weak duality theorem is very useful. So let me try to prove the weak duality theorem. Yeah, uh, let me try to prove the weak duality theorem rigorously, and then we'll talk about strong duality. So let me set up the problem in the following way. I'm going to call D as the set of mu such that Q mu is greater than minus infinity. And the dual problem is Q star equals to sup mu 
greater than or equal to 0 q mu oh mu is in d and the theorem is d is a convex set and q is a concave function that's the first result and the second result is q star is less than or equal to f star Okay. So, what does theorem 1 tell us about the dual problem? I am maximizing a concave function over a convex set. What kind of problems are there? Uh, so, what do you call such problems? They are convex optimization problems, right? Because I can write it as So this is, so Q is concave, so minus Q is convex. You have a convex, op, convex uh, set, so you are actually solving a convex optimization problem when you are solving the dual problem. Okay, and whenever you are trying to solve a convex problem, you are always guaranteed to converge to the truly optimal solution because of the nature of all the algorithms that we have studied so far. So in the case of convex problems, they all converge to the optimal solution because first order necessary condition is sufficient for convex optimization problems. Okay, so theorem one tells us that the dual problem, no matter what the primal problem is, primal problem could be very, very complicated non-convex problem, doesn't matter because the dual problem is always going to be a convex optimization problem. Okay, and the second theorem, which we have already proved pictorially by looking at the picture, we have already established this result, but now we will prove it rigorously on the other side. So this is proof of theorem two. Theorem one is proven in the book, so you can always take a look, but the key outcome like the key uh, thing that I want you to note after reading theorem one is the fact that this is a convex optimization problem. Okay. For all mu greater than or equal to zero, we have Q mu equals to inf of Lx mu. Okay. 
for all x in capital X such that g of x is less than or equal to 0, we have q of mu equals to n of this whole thing, which is less than or equal to Let me not write the n. Uh, for all x bar, such that g of x bar is less than or equal to 0, we have this is less than or equal to fx bar. Okay, so let's look at it. What is going to happen for all such x bar, where g of x bar is less than or equal to 0? I have mu j, which is non-negative, and g j, which is less than or equal to 0. So this term would become less than or equal to 0, right, for all such x bar. And so therefore, what you're doing is you're subtracting from fx some negative, like not negative term, but non-positive term. So that's always less than or equal to f of x bar. Okay. Now this is true. This equation, this inequality, holds for all such x bar where g of x bar is less than or equal to zero. So this means q of mu. this holds, which is exactly equal to f star, right? So q of mu is less than or equal to f star. This is what we were discussing in the picture, that q of mu will always be less than or equal to f star. Okay. So I have Q of mu, which is less than or equal to F star. F star is a constant. What happens if I take supremum over mu and D on this side? Well, it's also less than or equal to F star because this whole, this Q mu less than or equal to F star holds for all mu greater than or equal to zero. So I will take the supremum on the other side and I get I get Q star is less than or equal to F star. So what we had shown pictorially is actually true by going through a rigorous proof and figuring out that, okay, that, that, that particular observation is actually true no matter what kind of function you have and no matter what kind of constraints you have. Notice how, so far, we didn't talk about the differentiability of x until this point. We haven't talked about differentiability of f. We haven't talked about differentiability of g. 
We haven't talked about the kind of set X is, whether it's discrete, whether it's continuous, all of that doesn't matter now in the, when we are talking about duality. And that's really the key power of this particular result. This result holds no matter what the set S, X is, no matter what kind of function G is, no matter what kind of function F is, this Q is always a concave function, D is always a convex function, and Q star is always less than equal to F star. Okay, in, in complete generality, doesn't matter. Differentiability doesn't matter. Discrete set, it doesn't matter. It's true, no matter what. Okay, and that's the power of the duality theory that we are currently talking about. Okay, contrast this with Lagrange multiplier theorem and Kikiri theorem which required function to be twice differentiable, continuous derivatives and so on and so forth. X was supposed to be a subset of Rn. When we talked about optimization over convex set, we needed X to be a convex set. So there were a lot of restrictions in some of the earlier stuff that we were talking about, but in this case, there is no restriction whatsoever. So this is what we are going to do in the next class. I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about the primal problem, and I'm going to talk about how do you get the dual problem, which is max of Q mu, mu and D. So we'll talk about it in the context of linear programming. We'll start with a linear program, and then we'll try to come up with a dual program, dual uh, problem which would also be a linear program. So that's the first thing we will do in the next class. And then we'll talk about duality gap and under what conditions are there no duality gap. So duality gap is referred to the difference between F star and Q star. So if the difference is greater than zero, you have a duality gap. If the difference is equal to zero, you have no duality gap. And so we'll talk about under what conditions can you show that there is no duality gap and therefore Q star will be equal to F star. So that's the topic we will study on Monday of next week. And then Wednesday onward, I'm going to talk about dynamic optimization problems. Okay, which is, yeah, you have a question? How did you get the second answer? This one? Yeah. Uh, this is right here. Oh, you said this one? Yeah. So this is infimum over all X and X. Right? So I'm picking an, a, a specific X bar. That's specific. Right. So this is infimum. So infimum is certainly less than or equal to F of X bar plus summation. Right? So this term is less than or equal to zero. Okay, any other question? Okay, if there are no further questions, let's adjourn for today and we'll see you on Monday. <laughs>